15 minutes. Now, should I be in in the sideways landscape mode or the portrait mode? What's better for you? Land, landscape, landscape will be better. That's fantastic. This, so this is good. Okay, great. Hello and welcome to The Last Movie Outpost. Now, you may have recently seen I did a short video on Biggles Adventures in Time, one of my favourite childhood movies. If you'd have told 11-year-old me that I would be interviewing the star, Jim Ferguson, <laughs> I would never have believed you. But here we have, uh, I see that you've put your name up as Jim Ferguson, but we have the actor Alex Hyde-White. Hello, Alex. Hi, Phil. Thank you. Hi, how are you? I'm very good. Thank you very much. How's yourself today? You good? Yes, in New York City. So I'm um, happy to be talking about myself. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in New York, if I can ask? I'm at, uh, I'm at a publisher's conference. I recently released my memoirs in which Biggles, you know, takes up a good episode or two because it was my first big break in the uh, in the mid 80s. And my book is called In the Volume, and it's uh, published by a by a group affiliated with Simon and Schuster, and they are having a uh, authors conference, and um, that's tonight and tomorrow here in New York City. So I'm looking forward to that. Fantastic. We will put a link up on the on the website, and I know I will certainly be buying a copy because, like I say, it's uh, it's it's just a pleasure to talk to you. So, like I say, I mean, you've been acting quite a long time before Biggles came along. How did you hear about the role and get the role? Well, funnily enough, I started in 79 as I was, um, uh, I was 19 years old and, um, I started as a contract player at Universal flying jets in space for a show called Battlestar Galactica. <laughs> and, um, in 83, I came over to England using my British nationality, was able to work there and, um, I just sort of um, got got lucky and got a mini series that filmed in Athens about the recreation of the first Olympics, the um, 1896 Olympic Games, because the LA Games were going to be uh, right right there in um, in 1984. So um, I had a good agent, and then the following year I went back, and they were just beginning to cast Biggles, and so it was one of those things that you know, I write about in the book is it, perseverance plus timing or luck can equal opportunity, you know, and yeah, it, and uh, it happened very quickly. I found myself being a bit of a bigger fish in a smaller pond because I, <laughs> I, I, I could play American, obviously, because I was, you know, I'd, I'd been living there, even though I was born English, but that allowed me to work there legally because you know at that time there was uh, yeah. uh, there was an awful lot of um, uh, 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 bureaucracy involved uh, for for anyone not english to be able to work there and so i was a british subject which saved the production company a lot of paperwork and a lot of hassle excellent now i know or i read that you and neil dixon because it was kind of neil dixon's biggest big sort of yes. biggest sort of role today but you guys are still in, still good friends is that right you know phil it's very rare and you know it's again it, it it's it's in the book how lonely a profession it can be you know it's a great job acting certainly when i was lucky enough to get started it was sort of one foot in the old analog way studio system and film in the camera and uh, intense mm. bits and pieces and it's all been revolutionized and democratized, um, uh, much to the benefit, uh, uh, as as it has in in your side of the game. You're able to, um, you know, express your express your opinions and fandom, and you do it in a very professional way, thanks to the access that you know digital media gives you. Mm. So yeah. uh, that's a, that's a fancy way of saying I, I I'm old enough to really learn the old fashioned analog way to do it. And the jobs are great when, when one gets them, even the modern day ones. The profession itself can be very, very demanding, very uh, appeals to the narcissistic qualities inside us all, and very lonely. So it's a long way of saying very rarely do you make a friend. And Neil and I just became, well, we were very close, bonded in the sense that um, we were both given these breaks at the same time 
and sort of um, bonded even further when it sort of didn't work out the way that it, that we had hoped. And so, you know, yeah. misery loves Cause... company. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, with it, and initially the series was supposed to be a kind of complete um, series from the books and so forth, wasn't it? So, I mean... Uh, obviously at the end of the movie there is there is the chance of a sequel but it never happened but did you guys ever hope that there would be a sequel come from it yes well, we lost hope very soon after the film was released <laughs> and i'll tell you very quickly and you hit you know there was uh, uh, the backstory of the biggles franchise uh even though one was aware of it just watching your uh, lovely um, 15 minute short about it was most educational um in that what it meant to that sort of world world war one kirka world war two era and you know it was parodied and biggles flies undone by monty python which made it you know even <laughs> yeah, more yeah. famous but you know you hit the nail on the head in the video about it and i encourage your readers just to see it not so much for nostalgia not as much as for nostalgia as for a as, as for a reminder how predatory uh, uh, you know, any business involving, you know, yeah. human talent is. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, you know, uh, this whole, this this project of Biggles was a bit of a hoodwink, all right? Um, for Neil and uh, all those boys, Michael and James and Daniel, the late James Saxon, to play those lovely characters, they played it straight and they played it beautifully. My character, as much as I was happy to do it, it was a Michael J. Fox ripoff from Back to the Future. <laughs> And I didn't know that until afterwards. I was doing another film that summer in Greece and I read about this Back to the Future. And I thought, oh my God, these Biggles producers have tried to rip that off as if thinking that yeah. they, needed, they needed to be modern, you see. Mm. And um, this the, the writer Groves, as you said, would have denied it yet would like, uh, you know, very interesting. He wrote the Back to the Future ride for Universal, yeah. so, you know. Yeah. Uh, it, you know, so it was, it was There's a lot of similarities there. Yeah, it was, a, you know, it was ultimately a bittersweet experience for me, but ultimately it was a wonderful uh, memory. It started my career. It, I was able to carry a film um, and mm. it was a lot of fun. But I think had we known that it was a bit of a boondog, we would have camped it up a bit more. We would have tried to be a bit more funny, you know, yeah, and lean into it a bit. Yeah, 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 yeah. 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 And we were. You know, and then you you mentioned budgetary constraints and all that bit. And, you know, if you're going to take on something and, you know, it's rather pompous of the producer to say this was going to be our bond. And then at the same stroke to have to say, well, because of budget considerations, you know, <laughs> we had yeah. to, we, it was only B and D. Well, if you're going to make a bond film, you need the O. Or yes. <laughs> Yeah, exactly. Um, I mean, with it, were you a fan of the books? Did you know anything about Biggles know, before really you went into it? About, I didn't know a thing about them, and that played in my favor. It's okay, you know. Um, uh, no, I, I, I learned a bit, you know. I suppose it's a bit like Dudley Do Right would be to the Canadian Mounties, or yeah, Jennings yeah, yeah. and Derbyshire would be to, to the Hardy Boys, and things like that, you know. But no, I mean, I'm sure that they're fun. Uh, now that I now that I, uh, I produce and narrate audiobooks, I do a lot of sort of those English titles and uh, a lot of World War II history and and historical fiction. And so it's nice to have a broad stroke understanding of it. And the more, you know, I just appreciate good writing. And I bet you those those books are very well written. I I mean I haven't read any for many years, but I do remember reading them growing up and being a big big fan of Biggles and yeah and like you say it was it was kind of a shame because I know when the when the movie originally started it was supposed to just be kind of a, you know a World War One epic but then they added this time travel element not because of Back to the Future but they obviously put that in but that's kind of one of the things that unfortunately put the British press off a little bit wasn't it yes I think that you see <laughs> I, I think you can even be 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 more accurate there in the sense that um the agencies in town, I know I know that the William Morris agency represented uh, the author at the time, and they represented me in London. And there was an awareness of, of, the, uh, of the Back to the Future project and yeah. the time travel and all that bit. But I'm not so sure that it was the same block of producers that had it when we, when, when we did it as who has had it when it was going to be, you know, it was more like a Richard Attenborough film, uh, right. <laughs> you know. Yeah, yeah, and yeah. John Huff, our director, who had cut his teeth 
as a, a second unit director on the Avengers, famous story about how he got started. He basically went to the producers of the Avengers and said, let me shoot two days and I'll pay for it. If you, and if you don't like it, I'll pay for it. And they liked it. And then he became first unit <laughs> director. Yeah. Like you say, sometimes he's just putting yourself out there um, well, you know, to, to do that. Yeah. Yeah. He's, he's all, you know, he's, all, he's, um, I don't know where the, what is it? The, the Bow Street Bells or whatever it is, the definition of, 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 um, of Cockney in, in London used to be, you, right. could hear the, you could hear the bells, right? So it was very yeah, helpful. Yeah. And he and his wonderful, crazy old first assistant, John O'Connor, they were from another era. They were from that era of, it's all right, darling, and a bit like that, you know, and <laughs> um, rough, a bit rough, you know, lovely, nice fellas, but difficult in a way to work with because so controlling. And so when you, right. when you, when you had a project that was being sold as one thing, but it was actually being made as another and then being controlled by the lead creative, in this case, the director, very hard for two young actors uh, who are getting a break to realize that they have more power in a way than, yeah. than we felt. I had an inkling of it and, uh, you know, working with Peter Cushing was oh, wonderful. Cushing. And yeah. I had a I had a background in the business, being the son of a well-known British actor from another era, so yeah. I was I was given enough rope, so to speak, uh, enough leeway. But I just wish that um, we'd understood it was meant to be a bit more of a comedy. Yes, yeah, like because I mean, to me, it's an action adventure, and as I said in the video that I made, that you know, if you think about the story too much, it is silly, but it's yeah. pure entertainment. Is one well, of these, it, you know. It's what made Indiana Jones franchise uh, was the sardonic humor and the wit and yep. the ability of Harrison Ford to sort of change the direction of the scene uh, with an impression or uh, yeah. uh, with, with, with an improv improvisation. And there was some of that, but it sort of had to be approved. I remember Huffy, I'd said something to uh, uh, at the end of a take when we needed to do it again, something technical about, you know, well, you know, just put a piece of tape on the camera box if you want me to look there and he says all right all right alex come here, come here. alex if you're gonna say anything like that just you're gonna ask him you gotta come to me directly because <laughs> i can't i can't have you talking like that in front of the crew and you know we're in a trench for god's sake and there's things bombs going off <laughs> they wanted me to look with a nice close-up thank you very much but it's like you know i've got to look here instead of here and yeah. i know i know i know that but when you're in the action it's nice to have piece of tape yeah. on the oh, box yeah you know yeah it's just, uh, you, know, um, you know, if you like any of this, I would encourage you, please, to read my book, because whatever I've done over 100 uh, movies and TV shows, there's some funny, funny stories of literal of literally being in the trenches. And um, <laughs> it was so great to revisit them. And but, you know, Biggles, Biggles has a has a has a big part in my uh, in my in my psyche, in my experience. And it's wonderful to revisit it. Thanks to your prodding. Oh, no, that's no problem. Just as a last question, uh, it was unfortunately the last film that Peter Cushing made, or obviously sadly before he passed away. How would you sum him up working with him and as, as, as a person? There's made much written about him and uh, they've been, he's been part of some audio books that I've been a part of. It's a unanimous uh, set. Uh, it's a very consistent set of adjectives that are used to describe Peter. Kind, loving, professional, courteous, and forever matched to the love for his wife, who he lost, oh, you yeah. know, um, I think he lived 20 years, I think maybe after losing her. Yeah. And, and he invited us to dinner. Um, I went to dinner, his lovely country estate, yeah. uh, well, his country home. And, um, you know, it was as if you were entering a hall of remembrance in a way, you know, um, he was a very soulful man, very, uh, very complete, you know. Um, the wonderful thing about most British actors is they don't shade their personality, whether it's a Gielgud or a Richardson or a Tony Hopkins or, or even Daniel Craig these days, you know. They're very sure of who they are. But inside, they can be like all of them, like, uh, like everybody, very insecure. Um, but there's just such a wonderful technique. And Peter had a, he really put his heart into his work. And, you know, he was sen a sensitive man. 
But I mean, just a, a genuine cinema legend. I, I grew up watching oh, the Hammer absolutely. Horrors far before I, far younger than I should have been. <laughs> uh, but I mean, again, like I say, the man was just an absolute legend. And to see him in the movie again, he he he, he p- portrays himself as such a wonderful character as well. Yeah. But he just sounded like a, an absolute joy to work with as well. Very consistent. My father used to say he only ever had one performance, but it was good enough to last him 60 years. So, you know, <laughs> um, I've, I've been a bit split. I'm, I, I enjoy playing Englishmen, just like I did in a, a little little piece in Jordan Peele's film last summer called Nope. Yep. Played an English line producer that he knew. And, you know, he was, Jordan was surprised when I was speaking to him like this. Oh, you're not English. And it's, it's okay, we're good. <laughs> and then I play, I, then obviously I, I, I play lots of Americans, but I was influenced by some wonderful people. Um, Peter Sellers was an influence to me as a young fella, and he was a wonderful mimic, and he had the ability mm. to sort of create magic just with sound and, and, and look. Yeah. And so that's yeah. what attracted me really to film and TV, the, uh, the, as opposed to theater acting. I, I'm not really a conventional actor. I'm more a creature, I think, of the media that I grew up in like you did. I, I grew up 10, 15 years before you, but 70s television in America, 70s mm-hmm. films, um, the auteur period, um, films like The Godfather, Dirty mm-hmm. Harry even. And then of course, when Star Wars came, it changed the landscape for, for all of us. Indeed. Um, Alex, just hold up your book again so that we can <laughs> we can get the get the readers to like say have a look out for that Thank alex you. hide my life in film and tv it's called in the I'll, volume. um i'll certainly be looking out for it as well but in the meantime like i say biggles is one of those films that i cherish with fond affection i watched it to death on vhs i've got a little video about it and i urge everybody to to have a look at that alex hyde white thank you very much for joining us at the last movie outpost pleasure to be here good on you mate thank you <laughs>